jump right in yeah, and get started. It. That was a hot, Sorry, that's hot, a hot topic. It's a hot topic to jump off. But. So hi, everybody. My name is Jenny. Welcome to my Amulet podcast. Today, I'm joined by the wonderful Dr. Mesa. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself this time. Sure. My, my name is Adrian Mesa. Uh, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. And um, the name of my company is AMP Group Mental Health. And we're out of Coral Gables right now. Does that stand for anything? A- a- that's a great question. So AMP originally was just, AMP was founded in 2014 in order to help fund my photography to, as a tax your, write-off. Your hobby. That's nice. So it was actually Adrian Mesa Photography Group is oh what it God. was. I never, you know, I was trying to figure out and I thought it meant like um, something like Greek for health. So I was trying to figure out the words. And now I'm just, how no, stupid am I? Adrian but, Mesa, duh. But it's Adrian Mesa ph- Photography originally, but then I was like, oh no, it could be Adrian Mesa Psychiatric Group too. So Yeah, and then you know what I thought about too? Like Amped, like yeah. Amped for Health. So, so they, there you go. So yeah. we're starting a boot camp. It's going to be called Amp Camp. So get Amped. So that's going to be part of it too. That's nice. Don't ask me, it just... Things that's so interesting it. though, how it started like this, like, oh, whatever. Uh-huh. And it's transitioned into this amazing thing you're doing for the community i mean i'm trying my best um i just wanted to provide mental look mental health is so important yeah. and obviously now it's become more of a hot topic where pe- it, people are discussing it openly right it's not as stigmatized as it once was you can now have a conversation with somebody and say hey i'm seeing my therapist nobody's judging you or asking you oh are you is everything are you okay? okay sometimes people see a therapist because they're just in a point in time in their lives where they feel stuck they feel unsure they need guidance i mean i don't know about you i'm not an expert at living life this is the only life i know that i've lived so far so me neither so at (laughs) at times it gets confusing and so yeah just with anything right like with your career parenting if you're a parent um parenting relationships Mm -hmm. yeah i I feel like we all need help at some point or all the time just yeah, and that's that's why I'm here. I mean, honestly, I think that's my purpose is to help people. And so I'm building a team of therapists, psychiatric nurse practitioners. I'm working in conjunction with a psychologist. And the goal is just to help people and to let right. them know that, hey, mental health services are available. Um, there's help for you when you feel you're in, in a dark place. Mm-hmm. And there's hope and life and opportunity right. and so many beautiful things that life brings in the same breath. Will life kick you in the face? A hundred percent. It will. But that doesn't mean it's over. Right. You'll be okay. Yeah. Well, one of the things that um, caught my eye from, you know, doing research into you was obviously there's tons of people that do this, right? That help others with mental health. But you have this approach that's so interesting and refreshing. It's very direct Mm -hmm. and very human, like you're very um, approachable, if that makes sense. Like other doctors that I've seen, um, there, there's like this barrier, right? Like they're this extreme professional. Not that you're not. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm obnoxious. I am immature. <laughs> no, no, I am that's a not human. What I no, I am telling you that this is what I am, and I'm okay with it. Right. Um, and I think that we just need to make things palatable and we need to be able to have a conversation with people in yeah. society, whoever they are, whatever walk of life they come from. Right. I worked on the street with the homeless. The way I communicate with that individual on the street is going to be very different than the way I connect with a professional with an education. Right. I can be very raw and real with somebody who's living on the street because that is a life that they live. Right. right? And so if you approach them in a very professional, matter of fact by the book way, you're not going to get the right response. If you're approaching somebody who's Hispanic um, and you know their background, you know a little bit about them and their culture, mm-hmm. you're going to have a different approach and that's okay. And I don't know why we make it seem like we have to be scripted and robotic individuals. Thank you. That's exactly what it feels like. Yeah. It feels very scripted. Yeah. And from what I've seen, from what you do, it's it's very you know interpersonal. You really understand the people that are coming through those doors and yeah. that's that's probably why your success is imminent. That's amazing. I mean, I hope so. I, I hope that's why. Because I, I do. I just, I want to be, look, I'm not going to be the right fit for everybody. And right. different members of my team are not going to be the right fit for everybody. 
but we want to just educate people on whatever level they are. And I don't want to speak over somebody using medical jargon or vocabulary that right. they don't understand. Um, I want to speak it in a language that they are like, oh, wow, I get it. I understand. And if they have questions, they're not afraid to ask that question. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like whether you, you're a healthcare provider as a whole, you're not above the people that you're serving. You're right there with them. And you have to understand what they're coming from and what their goals are and not what your goals are for them. That's important. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I had never, ever thought of that. Yeah. Because yes. you might come to me and I might think, oh, you're whatever. You're going through severe depression. Your cholesterol is elevated. You're a control freak. Yeah. Whatever it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. But then you're coming to me because you're trying to make a life transition and you have a certain goal in mind. Right. So even though I identify different parts of your life that you might be able to work on and that I'm a little bit concerned about and how they're going to affect your future, I got to make sure that I'm addressing what you came through the doors for before anything else. Obviously, there are times where there's psychosis or suicidal thoughts or mm -hmm. something along those lines where the person needs help. But overall, we, you want to help that person where they're at. With right. the homeless, it was big. right? When I was on the street, I was helping them I might say, oh, you need to get housing and you need to, we need to start this long process of paperwork and whatever the case may be. But you're just thinking, I need a meal. Right. I need a cigarette right now. And so we need to build a bridge with people and meet them where they're at, regardless of what it is. If they're homeless, okay, so real quick, how long are we here for? <laughs> as long as you need. Okay. As long as you're here, I'm here. <laughs> okay, cool. So I'll give you an example. I sat, um, I sat in a meeting where it was individuals from Miami-Dade County, like mm -hmm. commissioner, like higher up people. Okay. And it was it was part of um, what do you call this when there's a like a panel? I was part of a panel. That's exactly the word. I was part of a panel, and one of the questions I was asked to the panel was, "Do we stop street feedings for the homeless?" And so, the argument by the two other members that were up there were was absolutely we're just enabling people and forcing them and letting them know that we're going to take care of them while they're living on the street and that's no place for anybody to live etc cetera, etc cetera. Right. and i was like wait where's the humanity yeah. right so if we know that food is something that's necessary for life right it's a necessity um it's a biological necessity why not use that as a bridge to communicate? There's organizations that are feeding them. Mm -hmm. Why not put teams of people that can help or assist them with those people who already have some sort of rapport or relationship with them, find out what their needs are and use that, that meal that they're providing on the street as a means of, oh, we're breaking bread with them. Let's form a relationship. Let's find out what your needs are and let's help you there. And then let's see where we move forward with that, whether it's to get housing, benefits, medications, preventative care. Yeah. But now if we just demonize people. That's true. And you make a lot of sense because especially in the country that we live in, food is so abundant. There's so much food being tossed. Mm -hmm. Why can't, like you said, build that bridge? Yeah, you know, and, and breaking bread, that's biblical. It's you biblical. know, it's, it's one of the the simplest things that you can do to connect with someone else. So how did they take your, your argument? I mean, it was back and forth. People, right. have, people are very grounded in their opinions. Yes. And, and I think they it's, hang on to them for safety, for dear life. Yeah. I think it's not until you take people out there and you start exposing them and showing them, oh, like, right. There's, there's all sorts of people who live on the street. And uh, um, it's interesting that I'm talking about this before anything else, because I think this is what, kind of formed part of my foundation in mental health because I started working with individuals who have nothing, right? right? Zero. Um, and so that's why I think a part of my approach is like live life and enjoy it and really embrace mm -hmm. whatever it is that you have going on around you because some people aren't that grateful. I'm not grateful. I'm sorry. Some people aren't that lucky. Right. You know, did you choose what zip code you were born in or no, who your mom is? No, I was born in Cuba. Yeah, I did so not choose go. that. No, I had no say in that. Exactly. You see? So imagine if you were still yeah. in Cuba, your opportunities are very different. My life would have been completely different. This podcast might not be happening, right? Yeah. So I probably would have been, God knows what, in jail. 
with a, maybe a, like 10 kids. I was going to say like three or four kids, but 10, hey. I or mean, 10, you're right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What what else is there to do? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. You're 100% right. There's no hope. There's nothing. So, yeah. And in, in your experience, because I know we've been told that people are homeless because of choices that they made. Mm-hmm. In your experience, from what you've seen, is that always the case? No. 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 Right? I mean, think about it. If you're coming out of the foster, let's just use a foster care system as an example. Right. And you're 18 and you get sent. Let's say you're done. The foster care system no longer takes care of you and you're left to basically fend for yourself. Now, there are there some transition programs that exist? Yes. But there's a lot of kids with a ton of trauma that just don't know how to navigate through life and they lack a support system. And the foster care system just isn't the best. And so some of them might end up homeless. Or how about somebody who has a psychotic episode, wanders away from their family just and gets lost. And they just stay in a state of psychosis. That's so scary. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of, there's, the world of homelessness is something that's very uh, complicated, complex. Right. Uh, um, and oh, just God. can't. Sorry. No, it's okay. We'll edit that out. No, you don't have to edit. You just let this ride. The um, it's just compli- It's extremely complicated. And for me to say it's simply mental illness. It's simply drugs. It's right. Um, how about the cost of homes in South Florida or throughout the United States in these big yeah. cities? Uh, so there's a lot of reasons why homelessness happens, and it's not Are just because of choice. Are you seeing more like a growth of um families that are homeless as opposed to prior years? Mm. So I, I honestly, I haven't been on the street in the past. Well, that's true. Yeah, I haven't been on the street as much in the past two to three years, honestly. Um, it, this is something I'm still super passionate about. And I want to make moves so that my business can either fund a nonprofit mm-hmm. or start a branch of AMP that still services the homeless. Why? Because I feel like there's a mission field throughout the world. And right. the times that I felt the most alive was when... And I'm going to say a shout out here. She has no idea. People come into your life and they inspire you. And mm-hmm. they have no idea just by telling their story. And I think that's why my voice is getting louder. Because I know that I know how people have influenced me. And I want to have that same positive impact on other people. Right. So there's a girl named Christy Mito, who um, She is actually a teacher. or I don't know if she's still teaching now. I haven't spoken to her in probably in a couple of years. Besides maybe a message here and there between me and her, her husband, Sam. These two individuals, they're huge in the church. Um, and back when they were dating, she came back to church and just said she had been in Dominican Republic at an orphanage where later on I went wow. to volunteer on two different occasions. Um, but her story of just wanting to serve really impacted me and was a seed that she planted in me. And so after I had been on multiple missions to Haiti, to Guatemala, um, to Dominican Republic, I always wondered to myself, where's my mission field here? Mm-hmm. And so, because whenever I left on one of those mission trips, I felt so alive. Yeah. I felt like, you wow, this purpose. is cool. Yeah, there's a huge yeah. sense of purpose. I'm helping all these people. Right. Um, and so I, I needed to decide where's my mission field here. And it, it happened to be with the homeless. I was walking around with my camera. I decided I wanted to get into street photography in 2012. So a lot of the people, I had people who I had taken photos of before I went to Camilla's house to work, who later on I helped them get housed, their benefits. Wow. Yeah. Talk about like the full, full circle. circle. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's been pretty cool. And so that's what I want to tell people is what's your purpose? Where is your mission field? Who do you want to serve? Right. right. Be, not just yourself, not just buying a Rolex or a YSL purse or whatever it is that you want. Yeah. But like, what does your heart tell you yeah. to do? And it, it's difficult for people to understand, and they think it's counterproductive. But when you really find a way to serve, you're actually helping yourself. That's what I was gonna say. So, you know, so, so it's te- it's very selfish, in, in, but in the most selfless way possible, mm-hmm. where everyone benefits. Yeah, they say altruism is the most yeah. egotistical thing you can do right. because at the end of the day, it is self-serving. Right. But the cool part is, a lot of times, I and I've written this and said this in a lot of different ways, but. You go out there thinking that you're Superman and you, you go out there thinking that you're going to save the world. And in the end, you realize that the people that you're going to save are actually saving you. Right. Because they're giving you perspective, gratitude, hope, love. They show you a whole different world that you were not privy to. Yeah. 
And I'm not trying to cry on this podcast, but just keep <laughs> it's, <going>. okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's <laughs> okay. But this is where my heart is, right? This yeah. is where, like seriously, this is where my heart is. My heart is tell. for people. I can tell. And if you decide to move on with that nonprofit, count on us because I would love to be to help to that's be cool. involved. Yeah, that's down the road. I'm I'm trying yeah. to. I feel like my brain is constantly firing, and I have a lot of different ideas. So far, it's working, keeping right. it in order. Yeah. Um. So we're. Like I said, my practice has grown tremendously in the past year. We were talking about it before mm -hmm. we, we came on. Um, I'm hiring people. I'm making moves. I'm moving my office currently. We're operating mostly telehealth, so the overhead isn't that much. It allows me space to grow. Right. It's convenient for the patients who are seeing us. Um, but then also, I, I'm, I just, I, I'm looking for more ways to serve the community, whether, like I said, through a, a boot camp that we want to sponsor for the community for free on Saturdays or whether it's possibly serving the homeless in the future. Shout out, if you do want to help the homeless, there's an organization called Choose Love Foundation. So if you just go to Instagram, at Choose Love Foundation, mm -hmm. they go out every Tuesday night and they feed and clothe the homeless and they do it with love. They pray for them. And dignity. And dignity, yeah. And I think that's so important. Yeah, so that's a really cool, it's a very small organization. It's not... They literally just go out Tuesday nights. They go to a couple of different spots starting in downtown right near the Adrian Arts Center. And they bounce around to like three or four. They're probably done like around 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, but if you want to volunteer, I know people sometimes reach out to me and I send yeah. them there. I'm like, go here because there's no paperwork. There's no bureaucracy and yeah. you can go and help. So, that's amazing. That's it. Especially for like the younger generation. Well, everyone should help. But everyone. Yeah. Especially the younger generations for them to really see. To get exposure. Right. That there's a whole world mm -hmm. that, you know, we're fortunate enough not to know ourselves. Yeah. But it's there. It's so it's there. It's around the corner. It's so Literally. There. I actually just presented. I, so I, I talk a lot about homelessness and I presented mm -hmm. in Mexico City via Zoom. Um, even though I had gone two years before. I'm not trying to brag, but I'm bragging because it's pretty cool that a kid from Hialeah gets you invited should. to Mexico City to speak in a language that is not my first language. I speak Spanish, but I do get stuck. Um, so you learned English first? Yeah. Well, I learned. I grew or up learning Spanish simultaneously. Yeah. Right. But then once you hit elementary school, like I know. Spanish goes to the wayside. Luckily, in high school, I had a girlfriend who her mom solely spoke Spanish, um, and Noelia became almost like my second mom during that oh, period of my life. Nice. She's amazing. She. I still talk to her, um, and. She forced me to learn Spanish. And so now I'm so grateful that I was stuck speaking to Noelia in Spanish because um, now I communicate with Spa with patients in Spanish. Uh, well, that was going to be my question. Yeah. So do you see patients in Spanish? Absolutely. No. My convers So conversational Spanish, I'm fluent. Okay. It's the... It's There's certain times where I'll just get stuck. So especially... Maybe when it, your nerves kick in. And presenting yeah. in front of an audience in Mexico... Um, just like, well, Spanish is my first language, and sometimes when I have to do things like that, I get stuck too. Yeah. And there's like that one word that wants to come out in English, and you're like, no! Okay, no. Brooke, here's a test for you. I mean, it's probably going to be really easy for you, but I got stuck in front of the audience. Hospitalization in Spanish. <clears throat> Hospitalización. Hospitalización. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> you're see? close, yeah. you're close. It was rough though. I was, and after a while, they started laughing because I just turned it into a joke. I was like, "Hospitalization? Do you understand? <laughs> All right, cool. Let's move on." So you got to talk to them about um, the homeless situation in Mexico City. No, the homeless situation in Miami. Oh wow! Yeah, so I was just trying to bring to light, like I, I kind of bring to light aspects that people would never see as tourists or things that people don't talk about, even after they leave Miami. Yeah. They might see it, but it's they're just bodies on the street. That you just drive by. You don't. You don't. You don't look. You don't look. Of course you not. Why well, look? Most isn't that what we all do? Somebody yeah. walks up to your window. You look away. You look at yourself. You don't phone, make eye contact. You don't make eye contact. So that's it's, why it breaks my heart because it's yeah. It's like denying their humanity. You're, they're not there. If I don't see you, you're not there. Well, you can't. So I'll my, I'll I'll be the devil's advocate and I'll say, but you can't save everybody. And no. sometimes you don't have that emotional room to bring something else in. Yeah. Right. We can't always be a bleeding heart. And sometimes, heart. I mean, I don't know if that's ever happened to you because you're you're you know a doctor, you're more prepared. But I don't always feel safe. You know, making that connection, lowering I, the window. You know, if yeah. it's ten o'clock at night and I'm by myself, and I think it's different for a woman. 
Uh, yeah. I know. I think it has, a, it has nothing to do with training or anything. I just, I think it has to do with. No, I just assume you know what to do. No. <laughs> you have a magic phrase no, that can help everybody just no, chill. <laughs> there's no magic phrase. Sometimes I'll be like, oh, he's psychotic. Let me put the window back up. Yeah. Like he's not well. Right. And that's okay too. And I'm, yeah. I'm not going to sit here and try to pretend like I make eye contact and engage with every single homeless person that I walk past. Um, yeah. Because. I mean, if you want, we'll go downtown right now and there's probably about a thousand people in a 40, 40 block radius right. right now. So are some of these people, uh, people that have like uh, legal issues, of course, like um, immigration or so um, what's pedophiles? So, yeah, there's a huge area in East Hialeah near the railroad tracks. That's an interesting one. I don't know if this is still going on, but this was going on a few years ago. Oh yeah, this is this went dark real quick, guys. I'm sorry. Um, I mean, it's a reality, yeah. and I know I'm sorry too. But we, we kind of, I <laughs> no, feel no, like cool. we'll touch upon it and move on. Really yeah, fast. yeah, no, no, no. So there's an area. Actually, excellent topic, right? And I'll tell you why in a second. There is an area in East Hialeah where it's blocked off, and there's warehouses where there's people with former charges of pedophilia, and they're there. Um, they sleep in tents by the railroad tracks. There's no other. So there's this law in Miami-Dade County that you can't sleep within a distance of a school zone. Right. <clears throat> so let's just think about how ass backwards this is because <laughs> when people are sleeping, kids aren't in school. So what does it matter where people sleep at night? Hmm. Right? Besides that. That's anyhow, I'll, mo I'll move on from I that. I never thought of that. Yeah. So they can't sleep in an area that's close to the schools. Um. And they can't be within so many feet of schools. I don't even know the laws, honestly. But so these people are segregated off. It used to be off the Julia Tuttle Causeway for a while. If you Google this, yes. there was a whole pedophilia village that yeah. they called. As you drive towards the beach I on the Julia Tuttle, there was a bunch of tents. The tents. Yeah. Yeah. I well, that's that. because they didn't have anywhere else to go. Right. And then they told them, oh, you can come over here in East Hialeah. Shout out to East Hialeah. <laughs> no, yes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm from West Hialeah, so that's a thing. But don't worry. <laughs> um so basically they just they're they're cor they're corralled in this little area right. what was weird for me as a provider the first time i had to see somebody who was a pedophile was that i felt instant judgment right mm -hmm. and as a as a healthcare provider you have to leave all of your biases out the door right you have to leave a part of yourself outside and like i said you're you're trying to help the person who's sitting in front of you Sometimes you don't always agree with the lifestyle that they choose to live or the li or the lifestyle that they have lived in the past. Mm -hmm. But then you have a choice. Do I am I able to help this person? And am I able to really help them? Or maybe should I pass this person on to another healthcare provider? Not just neglect right. them, but say, hey. There's a better fit for you. Yeah, this is yeah. I'm not gonna be able to care for you the way I want to. Um, you don't have to tell this to the patient, but and the reason that happens is because you have a bias, right? Right. Yeah. Like, what if you're extremely Christian and somebody walks in and they're a Satan worshiper? Do you treat them differently? Or they're into Santeria? Do you treat them differently? Mm -hmm. And the answer right. is no, you shouldn't. You should be able to leave your bias outside. Right. But, but it would be good for you to recognize if you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. if not, then you can cause harm to that patient, exactly. right? Exactly. You might neglect. And what if they come talking to you about pain and you're just like, ah, oh, whatever. Let's deal with it. Suffer. Yeah. You deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> So that's happening right now. If you pay attention, there's healthcare providers that are speaking up because there's some sort of issue going on with an ICUs when somebody comes in and is sick with COVID and unvaccinated, mm -hmm. that there's some providers that are like, oh, they had it coming or right. they should have known better. Yeah. And hey, guys, that's not. I saw an article about that. that yeah. There was a group of doctors that said they wouldn't treat patients with COVID that were unvaccinated. What about the oath? That's all I could think about. What about the oath but you I don't, took? But I don't understand where that mentality is coming from. Neither do I. Because what What if you, you get a patient who just murdered someone and you're trying to save their life? They just committed the ultimate act of, you know, wrongdoing. Yeah, I, and here you are trying to save them. Oh, so going back to the pedophile, part of it was the fact that I had to understand him better. Mm -hmm. I talked to the psychologist I was working with. She's like, Adrian, do the interview. After the interview, ask all the appropriate questions. Um, and if you still feel uncomfortable, 
let's talk about this afterwards. Okay. And then we'll, we'll decide what to do. So I went ahead, I did the initial evaluation. And one of the questions you always ask is obviously about your own past trauma. And obviously this was, a, I'm not excusing his behavior at all. No. He had, he was a pedophile. He did time in prison. He was abused by corrections officers. He had PTSD as a result of the abuse he endured in prison, right? The acts that he committed were horrific. But when I looked from a, a bigger perspective, when I backed up a little bit, I realized that he was just caught in a cycle where he had right. been abused at the same age. Right. Again, hot topic. I'm sorry about all these hot topics, but no, hot topic. I think this is necessary. Please, a hot topic because people are like, oh, but still, don't excuse him for his actions. I'm not excusing. I don't him. think you're excusing him. I yeah. think it's important to understand where someone came from. Yeah. To, to understand why, they're going in a certain direction. Of course. And that's not an excuse. Yeah. It's just figuring out the why. Yeah. Figuring out. Figuring, and I think that is yeah. a huge part of mental health across the board, right. and for us as humans. Yeah. What's your why? What's your why? And it's why, the ultimate yeah. question for everything. Why do you respond the way that you yeah. respond to different situations, circumstances? Why do certain people trigger you a certain way? Yeah. Right. Why does this situation make you anxious, even though there's no danger that's around you? And so you have to understand where those feelings come from in order to treat them and do something about it. So were you able to help this person? I mean, obviously, I was able to help him with his anxiety and with insomnia and, and things of that nature. And I had somewhat of a relationship with him. Um, and then I'm not sure what happened to him. I know him. I remember his name. I remember how he yeah. looked. Um, but this was at Camilla's house at the time. And so the Is homeless population is transient. Is there a thing as um, recovering from pedophilia? Look, I don't want to come on here as an expert in pedophilia because I'm not. I was well, more, you know more than I do. No, I was dealing more with his symptoms of PTSD. Right. Um, you could talk to a psychologist about some of the pathology behind mm -hmm. um, sexual abuse and pedophilia. I am not the guy to talk to about it. I'm not going to even pretend. Okay. Yeah. Well, no. thank you for your honesty. Yeah, for sure. But that's that's a, a big question. Yeah. I've had for a while. Um. So I'll keep I'll keep digging because. Yeah. It seems that as of now, they can't completely get over it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, think. Yeah, but I don't. Again, I don't want to no, excuse it. They're condoning yeah. it. No, it's it's a part of humanity that. Yeah. We wish wasn't there, but. It's dark and it's present though. And it yeah. It's so present. It is. It is. Especially you know, as a doctor, I'm sure you see a lot of things, and if you're an educator, you see a lot of things, and. If you're out there in the community, in whatever field, you see things that you're just... Yeah, that, that some other people aren't exposed to. And so it raises questions and it raises eyebrows. And you try to get a different perspective and understanding of it. Mm -hmm. So, And a lot of the times it happens in places where you would never think. You would never, you know, say, yeah. not that family, not in that school, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So it's... It's interesting that we have to be aware. Yeah, I mean, historically, look, the Boy Scouts are are have been under a huge microscope for a long time. The Catholic Church has right. been a huge pedophile ring. Like, let's speak clearly. Again, hot topics, but yeah. these are things that I'm interested in, right? Right. Because I want to understand you look why for it that happened. Why? Um, you kind of start to see, you know, a pattern. All these altruistic professions mm -hmm. and life dedications cost to a certain type of person mm -hmm. so it kind of makes sense you know or it just becomes a feeding ground where they realize oh we have vulnerable prey in these exactly. in these areas and yeah. so that's where i should gravitate towards i don't i don't know i don't have answers to it but i know it's sometimes it's, the question though is more important than the answer you're right yeah because the question at least takes you someplace yeah for sure yeah so Definitely interesting. Yeah. So let's back away from that a little bit. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. So because yeah. I want to make sure I clarify this. So you keep saying you're a doctor, you're a doctor, you're a doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. Right. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. I have my doctorate in nursing practice. Mm -hmm. um, I did complete a doctorate degree. 
people get very sensitive about this topic in particular yeah. um because mds feel and well, again woof, i'm mm -hmm. spitting fire because <laughs> i know i'm gonna piss off some people and that's okay um but i think that if you have a doctor degree you can call if you are a psychologist like let's say today i'm gonna see a gentleman his name is dr juan lasende i'm gonna go see dr lasende he's not an md he's a psyd which mm -hmm. is a clinical doctorate um my dmp is a clinical doctorate these people can be called doctor mm -hmm. mds don't own the title doctor well thank you for saying that because i had actually had that conversation once when i was still in the classroom because we had um, a, a, a new faculty member come in and she has a PhD. So we're talking about how she, uh, we were gonna call her doctor so-and-so. And some kids were saying, oh. She's, she's not a doctor. So I went in, you know, into this whole history lesson that the first doctors in the world were educational doctors. Uh -huh. MD doctors did not exist for about another 300 years okay. after. So, so know it's okay for you, you to be called doctor yeah. because you earned it. And so did all those other people. But people get offended if I give, um, let's say specifically about COVID, if I say any opinion on it, based on- How dare on, you have an opinion? <laughs> but the fact that I've, I always put Dr. Adrian Mesa, that's also right. my, um, what do you call it? I guess my Instagram name, what, what's the- Your handle? My is handle, that what it is? there you go, okay. your handle. So since my handle is Dr. Adrian Mesa, I've received, you're not even a doctor. How dare you put out this misinformation? You <laughs> actually said that. <laughs> what? Are you? Maybe you should make a post with your diploma. I will. <laughs> with all of them. <laughs> with all, exactly. Because it's more than one. Yes. Like yeah. A, you me, worked hard for that. I did. Darn it. I did. And I never thought I would get a doctorate, honestly. Um, well, good for you. Yeah, I'm just a kid from Hialeah. I, tell, I used to tell my students, standing up in front of a class of 150, 150 people, I don't know how I got here. I'm just a kid from Hialeah. I'm here. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you everything I learned. And I'm going to say it with humility. And I'm sure that there's people in this audience that have so much to teach me too. And that's right. my approach. That's yeah. why I love... That's why I want to do a podcast too. It's not because... Who knows what will happen from it? But how much do you learn as you talk to more and more right. people? Yeah. Like how much exposure Well, that's do you one get? of the things I loved about being a teacher. Like a, a lot of my students would ask me, like, why why are you a teacher? Like, yeah. why are you here? And it, it was that revelation where, yeah, I'm here to teach you, but I'm actually going to take a lot more away than what I'm giving. Of course. And it's, again, it sounds counterproductive. Yeah. But unless you experience it, you don't really realize the scope that you get from being in that position. So in the end, we're just selfish people that we we pretend I like am. we want to give a lot, but we're just receiving from I am. everyone. I am, <laughs> and, and it's it is what it is. It's I'm great. Not, no, it's cool. I'm not gonna hide um, it. That's what I'm gathering. I'm saying, well, I'm helping the homeless because really they're helping me. Yeah. I'm wanting to talk to people because really I'm learning from them. I guess I, I you know what? Yeah. If there was a lot of if there was more of that selfishness in the world, exactly. I think it would be good. It's a good it's a good way to channel that selfishness yeah i feel like um yeah i i think you put it perfectly i wanted to ask you about you know the last year with oh, covid this water is amazing by the way yeah this, this is, is um are, this is your sponsor or what no i wish shine water sponsor us shine this is really this is, really good I, i've um, never had our this before. friends uh our friends who own a non-profit uh, their friends uh created this and they highly when they went through covid this is all they drank and they highly recommended it because it has like vitamins and electrolytes and stuff so it's like a gatorade but better for you and i'm hooked ever since they recommended it i can't stop drinking it it's so and they have different flavors it's really good right <laughs> it feels like a plug so not sponsored but <laughs> i'll take I, it i'm 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 a fan Me and too. i'm Starting Call a, me. I'm starting, a, <laughs> I'm starting a boot camp. I might need you guys too, but... Yes. It came from Miami Lit. Better than Gatorade. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Although we like Gatorade too. We're not We're not going to say no. You got to get a little swipe up. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, the last year, right? So you opened up your practice during COVID. Yeah. Well, so it was already open. Right. Yes, you're right. Yeah. So I was a full-time professor from 2015 to 2020 at the I University of Miami. Um, on June 1st, 2020, I um, got a Zoom call where I found out basically that I was one of so many people who were getting laid off on that day. And they read a script to me. So as of June 1st, you're 
your contract with the University of Miami is being terminated. And then they continue to read the script. That's all I, that part stands out so much. That's all you heard. And I'm looking at my immediate boss, the dean of the school, and the lady from HR. Like, as soon as I got on the Zoom meeting and I saw those three people, I was like, well, what did I do? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Oh my um, goodness. And so my, my response to them was like, wait, as of June 1st, t- today's June 1st, guys, like, I'm, I lecture later today. So I was, you told, they told you the day of? Yeah, the day of. Yeah, this was like today. Oh like, my goodness. In my head, this was like three weeks before June 1st. No, no, no. So you had no time to acclimate. Like no, it was like instant. Zero time. I was lecturing that afternoon and I was not allowed to lecture that afternoon. Wow. Yeah. That was. Oh man. And apparent. I, somebody was telling me that's the model that exists right now for letting people go in big groups that there's no warning. Because okay. people try to retaliate or... I, I'm not sure what mm-hmm. the methodology is, but it was a swift kick in my ass. Um, and luckily, I had my practice going already. I was only seeing about five patients per week at that time. Um, I, I Again, I think I saw 160... Not me by myself, but me and my right. team saw somewhere between 160 to 170 people last week. That's amazing. So from five to 170, I have... It was from me and my office manager, Nadia, who's the bomb, um and then later i acquired my friend alex so now it's one two i just hired a third one i think we have eight or nine people now that's amazing from a a practice that was for only a year non-existent yeah that's so 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 cool uh, i'm excited i feel like we're doing things right we're providing the right type of care yeah um the therapists that i have on board are amazing people who are in it for the right reasons Mm -hmm. um and yeah, so it's great because we're helping people. And at the same time, it's great because the business is becoming successful, you know, right. uh, which I, I don't know what I'm doing. I really don't. And I don't know well, what. Well, it, it sounds like you do. <laughs> you know something. So. I, so I know things because I have experience. Right. Um, and I know what kind of care I want to deliver. And I have different ideas. But in terms of the execution, mm-hmm. I, I have to say that hiring the right people has been everything. And I've been hiring quick. I don't know if you listen to Gary V, but uh, I don't. Gary Vaynerchuk. See, this guy already has million. He's like twenty something. I don't even know how many million followers he has. Mm, I should but check he's him out. like straight up cutthroat. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, yeah. He's straight up. He's cutthroat, and he um, and I kind of follow his advice in terms of, I mean, snippets of it. Right. He, he talks a lot, and he's constantly on. He posts mm-hmm. all day. Oh wow. Oh, he's a huge advocate for don't don't think twice, just post. Um, don't overthink so. it. Produce content. Get yourself out there. Get your face out there. Then I should listen to him. Yeah. Because I'm an overthinker. Yeah. No, he'll say post like, it. He'll sh- he has a wow. video that he produces like six posts in like six minutes or something. And he just shoots them up right there doo, 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 on all different platforms. And he's like, okay. I didn't even think about it. But look, let's see what happens with this. That's so, so late. Cool. That's why lately, like this morning, I went on a rant. Yeah. And this was something where last year at this time, I would have overthought it and I would have never posted it mm-hmm. because they're just my thoughts. And, and who wants to listen to my thoughts? That's right. True. This is the conversation that we have with ourselves. Yeah. Nobody cares about my photography. Who's going to really care about coming on my podcast? Mm-hmm. These are the negative voices and the negative thinking that sometimes consumes us and then paralyzes us. Yeah. And that's what I want to fight against. I want people to be be all that you can be i want people to <laughs> to really pursue their dreams man yeah. and, and pursue something that they're passionate about instead of f- succumbing to this nine to five grind that mm-hmm. becomes a rat race and a paper chase right like yeah. what are we searching for right um wow that's, <laughs> sorry no no it's uh, that's perfect because like you you put in, in in a couple of sentences everything that I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> we're done. So let's start. No, we're just getting started. Okay. Let's start with social media since okay. since that was the first thing you brought up. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you advise people to have a positive relationship with their social media accounts? Is that even possible? Um, for so yeah, I I think it is. I think I'm still working on it. Okay. Right. Um. But I think that you have to look at what what do you want your social media account to be for you? Mm-hmm. Do you want it to just consume you and consume your time? Or do you want to gain something from it? 
right? Right. You and I are sitting here right now because of social media. That's true. Right? This is a new relationship that we're forming, and you you and I are not going to forget this interaction. Right. Five years, ten years might pass, and I'm going to remember Jenny Ponce from Miami Lit. Right? Right. Why? Because we took our times to form this connection. So, so many people are using social media. Um, and I said it the other day, and I'll say it again. I mean, guys are sending each other twerk videos of women. <laughs> Girls are sharing makeup advice or whatever right. it is that women share. Guys are sharing sports clips and men's legs and arms getting snapped. Um, but then what else, right? Mm-hmm. That's like a superficial layer. Mm-hmm. But man, you can go a little bit deeper and have a real conversation. You have a little button on Instagram that has a FaceTime on it. Like we have access to people who we would have never had access to five years ago, 10 years ago. Right. So if you utilize it in the right way, this can gain you opportunities. It can gain you a ton of knowledge, right? Because you learn from everybody you encounter. Mm-hmm. Um, it can gain you experience. It can gain you, I don't know, cool stuff. I have no idea. Like anything. Right. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question. But, no, it, it, it does in a way because you... I mean, you said it. You have to think about what you want this to serve in yeah. your life. What what purpose, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's that you you pretty much did answer it. Yeah, it's it's a tool at the end of the day. Right. It, it's, it's like a, any other relationship, mm-hmm. right? Am I going to be with this person the whole day, every minute of every day, mm-hmm. or am I going to see them for a little bit, then move on to something else? Mm-hmm. And that at least that's the way. You made me think about it right now. Okay. I don't know if that's what you were aiming for. I mean, it's, it's more so like this world is about the opportunities we, we gain and how we help mm-hmm. one another. I mean, at least that's for me, right? right? And I think like this meeting right now between you and I, I don't know how this is going to benefit me and I don't know how it's going to benefit you, but I'm here because I I think it's a cool opportunity. Um. I think you were super authentic when we first spoke. You seemed interested. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, oh, how cool. And here's this girl pursuing something that she wants to do. And why wouldn't I come on and be a guest? Right. And, and why wouldn't I want to engage and see where this goes? Because cause you sounded passionate about what you were doing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, all right. So what if more conversations happen like that? Right. Man, I, I just feel, again, I feel like this world is... Like this, this, this box of opportunity, mm-hmm. and people just aren't sticking their hand in the box. Yeah, that's all. How do you manage to stay so positive and grounded amidst everything? Like you lost your job that you had for five years—not job, a career, uh-huh. right? Because you were a professor. Mm-hmm. It's a big thing to just let go of, and you're able to turn that into something great. And social media, you're able to tap into it in a way where it's it's functioning for you. It's adding to your life and not taking away. Yeah. How do you want to do all that? And then you're seeing people in your practice and talking to them about things that are dark and you're trying to bring the best in them. Yeah. We're going to die. Shit, yeah. <laughs> We're going to die. <laughs> and, and it's uh, honestly... That's probably a huge motivator that I just... Right. I just Memento mori, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's no getting out of that one. There's not. There's yeah. not. So why am I going to succumb to all these things that happen? Okay. When I was in Haiti, right after the earthquake. Oof. Um, so I think it's these moments that give me life, right? Mm-hmm. I'm in Haiti right after the earthquake. I was supposed to be with Project MediShare. We got our way. This is a whole different story. But we, go, I found this guy with a milk truck who had five paramedics from Miami who he kind of just grabbed and they were riding around the city. And I jumped on board. I, I was with Project MediShare. They had us moving boxes. We weren't doing anything productive. At least I felt. I was like, I didn't come here on this mission to help people who just survived an earth, earthquake. Or I came here to help, right. not to inventory boxes. So I found these guys who were in this truck and I jumped on board with them and we ended up riding around the city. And these are guys that, um, I remember Blanco and these guys are all fire rescue now here in Miami Dade. I don't, I haven't talked to them in years. Maybe they'll hear this. Um, Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I think they, they might. Um, 
And I remember we woke up, we slept outside, outside of this guy, man, Grant. Grant, was it Grant? Grant owned an orphanage over there in Haiti. And so we slept outside of the orphanage because we were afraid that the building was going to crumble. Oh my goodness. Right? Because there was cracks in the wall. There were still tremors going on after the earthquake. And the next morning when I woke up, I woke up at five. Like five in the morning, pitch black. I'm sleeping outside in Haiti. My mom has no idea where I am. Um, this was 10 years ago, so I was like 28. Uh, and we woke up. I woke up to the sound of somebody whistling coming up the street. And I was just like, we're going to die. Ghost. <laughs> um, that would be my first thought. Yeah, Ghost. I'm in pitch black. I don't even know where in Haiti. And somebody's coming whistling down the street, and this is where it ends, and we're gonna die. Well, little by little, it was actually a church that formed across the street. And it was a gathering that was happening super early at the oh. crack of dawn. I don't speak Creole, but all I heard was hope and faith and strength and oh resilience that just brought chills to my bones. And I said to myself, these people have just lost everything. Their homes have crumbled on top of their family members. Like my worst nightmare. I've had this recurring dream my whole life where I'm standing over here and my family's over here and they get struck by lightning. Worst dream ever. Don't have it, okay? I recommend that you no, don't. No, I'm not going to hang <laughs> on to that one. <laughs> Out of everything you said, that one, I'm going to let go of. So that's a horrible dream that I've had for a long time since I was a kid. I don't know why. And here I was around people who just lived my worst nightmare. Right. And still they, ex they, they exuded faith and hope and life. So I have no excuse to let being fired ruin my life. A family, I thought I was going to have a family. I'm a single dad, right? I thought when that was coming to an end, oh my God, this image that I had of this perfect thing and it's going away. It's okay. Life is still going to be good. Life is still going to be amazing. It's going to be plentiful. Right. So... I feel like people run into these walls in their life and they want to give up or they really let it consume them. And look, it's good to grieve and it's important to process. But also go through it knowing that, man, you're going to come out so strong on the other side. Right. Yeah, don't stay there. Yeah, don't yeah. stay there. Don't yeah. stay there. There's life. And I tell that to you, there's life. There's life outside of that job that's miserable. There's life outside of that marriage that's killing you. I, there's life after your children leave the home and it's not over then. Yeah. 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 Empty that's nest a, syndrome, a big right? Fear. right? Because because you surround your life and you build your life and you build your identity around these different things and you realize very quickly that it yeah. can be gone in a second. That's so that's so where my positivity comes from. <laughs> well, I, I now I understand. Yeah. 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 That's my mentality. Yeah. And it's it, it seems you know, that we should all strive to do that because I'm sure we've all had experiences that can kind of shake us and wake us up a little bit, mm -hmm. but we don't notice. And what do you do with it, though? Do right? you really process it and do you realize what's happening in your life or do you just sweep it under the rug and you move on and you let it affect you later on? So that happens a lot in relationships. Yeah. People get through this relationship, break up, whether it's horrible or peaceful or amicable, whatever it is. And they don't really process that relationship and what they gained and what they didn't and what they liked and what they didn't. They just move on to the next relationship. And what happens in that next relationship is that they're carrying things that they don't realize that they're carrying. Mm -hmm. And they have a mentality that existed in the other relationship and doesn't exist in this one. So I, ha I have a bit of a stupid question for you. Yeah. How do you know when you're done processing uh, something that happened to you? <laughs> um. I think you're always going to process because things are always going to come back up. But mm -hmm. it's what do you do with it? Because you should be able to realize like, I oh, see. this this is where this yeah. thought process is coming from. But I've overcome that. I've learned that that's not true. I've learned that there's different ways to cope with it. Um, so I don't know that you're ever done processing. I can tell you that you can. It's not affecting you the way it once was. True. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And you mentioned that you're a dad. Yeah. How do you handle... Uh, social media with your she doesn't have it how do you mind me asking how old she is she's 12 years old Ooh, so you're getting to that oh no no she had it for a little while she had tiktok um 
I saw how TikTok, um, as you go through the feed, how it kind of trends. It's not like Instagram where it's only people you follow. You kind mm -hmm. of just have yeah. different threads that come through. Right. And I realized that it was going, like, let's say she wanted to find out an innocent little dance, a TikTok dance. Other stuff is coming through. Oh, my God. What was coming that through? And not... then the music that yeah. they're dancing to, my daughter, I'm like, what song is that? Change it right now. And she's like, what? <laughs> what? What's going on? Dad? Yeah. And I'm like, you're not listening to that. Obviously, we're getting to an age now. She's she's twelve years old. Um, Does she have a phone? She doesn't have a phone. I, I'm actually about to get her a flip phone. You're gonna get her a flip phone? Yeah. Okay, because I've thought about that. But then, like, how do you handle the other kids making fun of them? I'm um, assuming they'll make fun of them. I, I make fun of my daughter enough that she has a she, strong she's, backbone. She has a thick. Yeah, I mean, I've made it so that the way I don't baby my daughter. I yeah. mean, I tell her straight up. I'm. Like, I allow her to express her emotions, right? Right. But I also allow her to be tough. So, yeah, social media and kids. Um, no, my daughter doesn't have... Yeah, she doesn't have social media. So you're going right to let now. her have a flip phone for now? Mm -hmm. And no social media till like... Do you have, like, an age? I don't even have an age. I'm I seeking advice. Like, so what advice do you have for parents? Honestly, as long as I could keep her away from... So there's different arguments to this, right? Mm -hmm. One is to teach them how to manage it on their own because eventually they're going to have access to it. Right. Um, for right now, I just think that there's other things that we need to focus on besides social media. Social media consumes me. Um, uh, right. right. That's how I feel. And, I just, and I'm, I'm an adult that I, can handle it. Exactly. In quotations. Yeah, I just hired, I'm trying, or actually I'm in the process of hiring somebody for marketing just so mm -hmm. I can push that towards her. Um because I do feel like it's very consuming. And I it do is, find myself yeah. going back to it. Or It's great for marketing. Right. It's amazing for marketing. But it's also like uh, if I can get away from it for a little bit. That's why mm -hmm. I think I love the gym. I love going out on my paddleboard. I love going to the beach. Like I, Things that take me away. At exercise because you're in the middle of something, doing something intense where you have to be mindful. Right. Anything that takes me away from it is healthy for, for me. Absolutely. Yeah. So do you, what would you say to parents that, um, what advice would you give them if they're entering that age where their kids are asking for a phone or asking to have social media accounts? What would be like the safest? So this is not even, this is not medical advice at all. This is parenting advice. Yeah. Um, it's just be very aware of what your, what your kids are consuming. Mm-hmm. Because what you, you know, what what you bring into your mind definitely affects you, now, it shapes you. Even if they don't have a phone, they have their laptops for school. Yeah. So they're, it's all there. Yeah. Whatever you, I mean, think about it. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, and you just, I, I just want to protect my daughter as much as I can. Absolutely. I, and I'm not going to, I'm. she's not blind to wars. She's not blind to poverty. She's gone out with me to see the homeless. So she knows the realities mm -hmm. of the world. And she knows the world can be a beautiful place but it can also be a really dark and harsh place right. teach her that but i also want to protect her and yeah. i don't want some stranger on social media or some feed to steer her towards let's say a behavior mm -hmm. um, whether it's sexuality or things that are inappropriate for her age look right. my daughter is not mine and I don't know if you understand. Our kids are not ours. I get you 100%. Right? And I think a lot of people live with the mentality that their kids are theirs forever. And my job is to raise this uh, this human to a point where I know that whether I like it or not, I have to release her to the world. Mm -hmm. Release. Right? But even right now, she's being shaped by the world. But if I can do my best to instill whatever values yeah. I feel are important, and my values may be different from yours, right? So who's to say what's the right way to parent? Right. I, I just want my daughter to have a sense of humanity, a sense mm -hmm. of compassion, to be driven, to be motivated, yeah, to be passionate about something. Independent. Independent. Self-sufficient. Exactly. Yeah. All those things. I think all those things are a great recipe for somebody who's going to be able to stand, you know, on their own two feet and take on all those harshness that yeah. we were talking about. Yeah. Are there. But man, you got to check them a lot because my daughter's it's growing tough. up with a lot more than I had growing up. Yeah. And she gets bored. Real, I'm so bored. And I'm oh, like, I know we have that conversation <sighs> all the time. Like, finally, I just say, you know what? That's a good sign that your mind is working. Yeah. And <laughs> if you're that? bored, draw. 
do something. Right. Use your imagination. Get inventive. Like, I grew up without a tablet or cartoons on the TV all day. And you you lived? You're alive? And I lived. (laughs) And I had to make stuff up. I do something. I agree. So she looks at me like. (sighs) How old is your daughter? She's 10. Oh, so yeah, we're right there. She's 10. Well, yeah. we're right there. Oh, She's the next 10. two years of your life are and going so, to be good. And um, so some of her friends already have phones. Yeah. And we are, we're not doing that. Mm-mm. Because to me, I equate it to like, and I've told her this, me giving you a phone is like me letting you walk out the street by yourself. Yeah. I don't do that. You don't go out by yourself and walk for 15 minutes. You're right. And then I hope you come back. I'm not giving you this device where I don't know what's happening. You don't know and what you don't have the maturity yet, no matter how smart or what great of a kid you are, to really handle that responsibility. No. It's not it's not gonna happen yet. So she's she's okay with it. Although she wishes I would change my mind. That's okay. You're gonna battle a little bit and that's okay. Yeah. That, listen, I'm not afraid of disagreement. Like yeah. we will disagree. And that's what it is. I think that's the hardest thing that some parents face today is wa- thinking that parenting and being a good parent is constantly pleasing your kids. I mean, yeah, obviously, I, we don't want our kids to not like us. Yeah, no, but, but sometimes... you have to be OK with sometimes them not liking you because that means that you, you're being you're preventing something because you're the front line yep. between them and whatever shit is happening. I agree. So. Sometimes you got to be the bad guy, man. And and it's hard, though, because I know is, I, str- I struggled with it a little bit. Yeah. And I started to realize, oh, like, my daughter's getting older, so our relationship is constantly changing, right? Mm-hmm. This It's so different. So I when you said my daughter's 10, my heart kind of was like, oh. oh. Yeah, because I've seen the transition <laughs> yeah. from 10 to 12, and it's been a huge jump, right? Um, Just in her behavior, mm-hmm. and she's becoming a, a woman, Right. Um, and I see it in her body and her mannerisms and and her thought process, and it, it's just it's different. And I'm like, wait, where's my girl? Where's it? And I'll have glimpses of it. It's usually when she's tired. That's when she gets yeah, all cuddly. They, they let their she's guard vulnerable. down. Yeah, she's <laughs> yeah. vulnerable. So Aww. yeah, so that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm I'm sure she'll they'll thank us oh. one one day. I hope, at least that's my prayer. Like when she's like in her 20s, she'll go, you know what? I get it. My daughter's so bougie. I don't know where she gets this from, but she's really? bougie. I'm so simple. I'm so practical. And she is like all about brands and she wants like, oh and I'm just like, who are you? Like, where do you? I'm like, you're, f-. and I'm from Hialeah. I'm proud Hialeah. Yeah. And I tell her all the time, Eva, you're from Hialeah. Chill. You're not from Coral Gables. <laughs> You're from Hialeah. It's I okay. I, I we tell our daughters to like you were born in the Palmetto. Okay, yeah. relax. <laughs> Humility. You were born in Palmetto. It's all good. Yeah. She she's not like super. Um, she's not there yet. Yeah. But I have noticed that like her little friends are already mentioning like certain like, Brand. fashion yeah. websites, and I'm like, how do you know that? Yeah. You guys are ten. It becomes important to them. It's status. Yeah. It's power. It's prestige. You know, yeah. privilege. Yes. All those things. Right. And right. so that's what kids kids see that kids see that. Yeah, it, it's true. It's true. Um, I want to ask you one more thing about kids. Uh, what about? I'm not a parenting expert by any means. <laughs> no, ahead. but you do have a certain background that's beneficial. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna take that ang- angle. Um, you and you touched on it briefly, like when when they're on social media, there's this like big push for. I feel like maybe I'm wrong over sexualizing everything, especially Mm -hmm. for kids. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you approach that conversation with your child? You tell them what sex is. Okay. Just like, have you had a conversation with your daughter about sex? No. Yeah. Not yet. Your daughter knows more about sex than you know, than you think she knows. Oh my God. Don't say that. I'm just being (laughs) very real with you right now. She's talked about it. She's heard about it. She's asked about it. She's 10 years old. You think she's asked about it? Cause oh. she she'll ask me. Like we we have a she's very. She's asking you to see what com- what you confirm that she already. <laughs> no no no. She hasn't asked me about that. But what I'm saying is like she'll ask me a lot of things that you know like whatever pops into her head she'll come and she'll ask me. Like we have a very no filter relationship. Mm-hmm. Like nothing's off limits. 
I don't act shocked, even though inside I'm like, I am. Good, good. That's so important. Maintain yeah, your affect. I try to maintain like, your affect. I'm not affected. Yeah. Like I'm good. Yeah. Um. So I, I'm confident that she will bring it up whenever she's curious. So so far she hasn't uh, brought that up. Like she's brought up. Like um, one of her classmates mentioned that he was gay. So she was like, What's gay? You know, this person said like. What, what does that mean? Like how, you know, so we had that conversation, um, but we haven't had the... Why? What about sex is it that... And maybe not just you. In general, what do you think scares parents about that conversation about sex? I think it just makes them uncomfortable. Or you. I, I don't want to speak for other people. I haven't had it yet because I'm... I wanted to find the right time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't want it to be too soon or too late. When is that? I don't know. <laughs> right yeah so i think it's better that you just educate her and you just shoot straight forward because look i remember in sixth grade we had um that human growth not human growth development sex ed yeah and they just threw right. on a video I think and my science time is, is coming because you know but i think by then i already knew what sex was right yeah, and that was back then i yeah. found a vhs tape of my uncle or something and i was like what's that so what do you mean of your like a VHS, like a <laughs> from a VCR. Okay, but it belonged to your uncle. Yeah, I was in his oh, room. Oh, I you meant that like. No, he no, was no, in no, the no, video. no, 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 no. No, that's like, whoa. Wait, that's hold tra on. that's trauma. I have to go to therapy for it. No, no, no. Oh my god. No, so no, funny. no. It was just I was at his house, and you know, it was a VCR, and I was just like, oh, what's this tape about? And. Oh. <laughs> You know, that's what happened. But imagine that was a VHS and that was by coincidence. Right. And did you ask questions or you were just like, no, I just showed my brother. I was like, yo, what is this thing? <laughs> that's ugly. Or is it <laughs> what is is that? your brother's older? <laughs> yeah, brother's older yeah. Oh, my God. He must have been like, what the yeah, heck, yeah. dude? What do I do with this? No, he's not. He's like, he's probably his first time seeing it, too. Oh, my Who God. knows? I don't know. I've never even spoken to him. I've never spoken. I, I'm just having a flashback right now that I'm just spitting out right here. But um, OK, so, so what, the reason I bring that up is because now think about it, her friends have a phone. Mm -hmm. So do you want billy to tell your daughter mm -hmm. hey come here look at this yeah let me show you something mm -hmm. no and your daughter's staring i know it's scary i can see your your face just changed completely mm -mm. <laughs> no because one of the things that like you know especially from being a teacher <laughs> that my husband and i always even before we had kids we always say we need to do the parenting mm -hmm. i'm not letting a teacher a coach a friend do the parenting mm -hmm. we are the parents of it's course. my responsibility so no, I I'm I don't want her to learn anything from anybody except so, for me. <laughs> so I think it's important for you to have yeah. that conversation. Right. And you keep it very okay. Another mistake is parents start going into deep details and they still when start, two people fall in love. Oh my God! Here we so go. No, that's no, no, not, no. That's just not the it, way to start. Be objective. Just hey, this is what sex is. Um, this is what happens. This is how pregnancy happens. Diseases can come from sex. I mean, if you keep it like that, and you just let them know it, this is. This is something that can be good or it can be destructive. Mm -hmm. Medication can be good. And if it's abused, it can be destructive. There's so many things in life that right. have that dichotomy, right? So I, I think it's important to have that conversation. Yeah. And I think right now, as I'm saying this, I probably have to revisit it with my daughter because we've mm -hmm. had it and we've had those talks where they get uncomfortable mm -hmm. because it's usually her and and my niece, Emily. So because oh I always bring them over for the wish. I always bring Emily over for the weekend often. Um. And so I, I'm like, I sat them down not too long ago. And I just side by side, all right, guys, let's talk about sex. And you could see oh. they're so uncomfortable. But I'm like, what do you guys know? And just have that conversation. First assess what do they know. Right. Where are you at? What do you understand about this? Have you heard of it? Have you talked about it? Right. Um, that's a that's good advice. That's a good starting point. Yeah, of As course. opposed to just going lecture yeah. mode. No, always assess. Pull out your PowerPoint. Talk first and see where they're at. Always assess first yeah. and understand where they're at and where they're coming from so you can meet them there and then take them on that journey. Right. So it looks like I have some homework to do. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. I'll pray for you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm going to need it. I'm going to need it. Um, have you seen, a, on the topic of kids, have you seen like a rise in anxiety with children? I've seen a rise in anxiety with everybody oh across God, the board. Yeah. Um Sign me up. I, yeah, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, instability that's going on um, just because of the last year and what mm. that has brought, whether it was COVID, 
Um, people had financial strain as a result. People lost jobs. Um, people were fearing that they might lose their job, but then right. didn't, but then felt like they were on the fence. And that brought up some fears like, oh, life isn't so stable the way I thought. Mm -hmm. And that's why it goes back to me saying like, it's not the end of the world. So I would hope that that would even ease anxiety if you approach things with that mentality. Right. Like these things can go bad and that's okay because it's not the end. Um, but yeah, has there been a huge rise in anxiety? Absolutely. Right. Let's talk about amped workouts. Okay. So you mentioned it would be a weekend thing. Yeah, probably sa to start, it's going to be Saturday mornings. Yeah. Okay. So here in, um, you're going to do it in the Gables. So yeah, here, here's my plug and, uh, let's see, cause I'm making it happen. Um, amp, AMP mental health. Um, I'm taking that amp, that AMP and creating a boot camp. Um, because I think there's a huge connection between physical fitness mm -hmm. and mental wellness. Um, I think that we're living in a society that is sedentary, um, right. that is not getting anywhere near as much physical activity as we should. This affects us not only, this is not only the reason that we have um, cardiovascular disease as the number one reason why people die uh, and die prematurely, but also it causes all these different health issues as you age. Um, and so, Beyond the physical ailments, there's also huge mental health repercussions for people who are physically inactive. Mm -hmm. And so I think I can help depression, anxiety, insomnia, and so many issues that are more, even panic episodes, um, help ease some of those mental health issues through the use of physical activity and by encouraging people to engage in more physical activity. Um, also, just get outside. Yeah. Do something active. Uh, use your body. Because if not, you can easily become a prisoner to your own body. And that's what I don't want. That's true. Um, so true. So AMP is going to be just that. It's a way to um, to give back to the community. To also honestly market my practice and let more people know that I'm here. I'm visible. Right. Um, and then just do something fun that I believe yeah. in that's awesome. Which is just challenging ourselves. And do people need to sign up or they can just show up? We'll see. I have, this you is like, worked it out no, yet? no, this is not. Okay. I literally just met, I'm actually developing the program now. My hope is that we'll probably have our first one late September. Um, oh, wow. So around the corner. Yeah. But I, we just, this is just hitting off right now. Like this nice. is, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so this is not like an exact um, model, but I really want this to continue mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, my idea is that this type of boot camp will not only happen in this park close to my house, but also I would love if in the future there was multiple right. trainers that I had at different camps following the same model right. and again, hosted by AMP Mental Health. Um, again, it's something I'm passionate about. It's something I've always loved. It's something yeah. I've always cared about. And I, I love it. I love challenging myself. I see. I love watching other people break past those barriers because I think it transitions those physical barriers that we set and that we can shatter and completely break through mm -hmm. are the same, are symbolic for the mental barriers that cre we create for ourselves. Right. So I think there's something that when humans realize that they can overcome these physical obstacles, that it translates into them realizing like that these mental barriers that we create ourselves are things that can be just destroyed, mm -hmm. right? Um, whether it's anything starting a new business jumping yeah. into a new relationship um starting a podcast putting your artwork out there whatever it is you can do it but you have to understand that those barriers are things that you create yourself right and so that's why i think physical i love when i work out with somebody and i'm pushing them and they tell me i can't and i'm like no absolutely you can let's go and they do it and afterwards they're so grateful they're like yeah. wow i I didn't know I could do that. I didn't, right. know I, I didn't know I could run that far, lift that much, or do 10 more reps when I thought I was going to faint. And see, it's exciting to me. I'm, I'm passionate about that. Right. No, and it's, I mean, there's so many studies that have shown that, but yeah. you don't really understand it until you try it. Yeah. So if, if anybody out there hasn't worked out in a while. Go get it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I hadn't, well, I hadn't ever stepped into a gym, ever. I was very like, I don't need to do that. That's, you know, I, I, I'm outside. I yeah. do other stuff. I don't yeah. need to go to a gym. And I'm not saying you do. Yeah. It's just my experience. But as COVID started, I started to experience anxiety, which I had never 
experienced mm-hmm. before. Um, and I was having a lot of trouble sleeping. Mm-hmm. So my husband said, "You look, you really need to, you know, do something." That's good. So I had a I have a friend, uh, Pia. She's she's awesome. She was the one that was like, "You you need to go to the gym. Like everything you're feeling, it's gonna go away if you go to the gym." So I went to the gym. I had that feeling that you're talking about, like, I'm going to die. Yeah. This is it. This is how I go. <laughs> My life is over. <laughs> to, like, all the, the, the stages of emotion. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, this is not so bad. Oh, wow, I feel really good. Yeah. Oh, my God. Great. Okay, I did it. Yeah. Awesome. I'm ready to take on the day. Of course. And then the next day starts all over again. Of course. Oh, God, I don't want to go. Oh, my God, I'm going to die. Yes. And then you go through it, and you just, and it, it really worked. Yeah. It was amazing. It still is, yeah. And that's what it is. And it's, and then people will say it all the time, the days that you really don't want to go, I mean, I still go. And somehow yeah. when I leave the gym, I feel different. I feel better. Mm-hmm. I feel a, a sense of relief. Something happens. Something clicks. Yeah. That, um, and it, it might not be like a big oh. thing. It's like yeah. the smallest feeling, but you just feel better. And then it gets to the point in your life where just that. When you don't go is when you feel weird, as opposed to when yeah. you go, you're worried about being sore, et cetera. It's like, oh, I haven't been. What's wrong? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Now I've got in there. Now when I don't go, I know something's up. You know, it's like, oh. Yeah. or And that's when you just got to force yourself to go. Because mm-hmm. think about it. We live we live in front of screens, sitting down all the time. Yeah. And it's horrible for us. We, actually, sitting is the new smoking. Have you heard this before? I actually funny that you brought that up i just heard that yesterday so i was going to tell you now. Oh, okay like, i yeah yeah so sitting is a new smoking in other words you start doing the math on how many hours a day you sit and it's actually a determinant of health outcomes mm-hmm. so it's really important for you to recognize like hey guys we're very sedentary in our jobs there's no physical mm-hmm. labor going on um and this is going to even get worse as artificial intelligence and robotics come even more into play there's not many labor jobs so we're literally going to be like, um, what's the name of that movie? The, is it iRobot? Uh, no, it not iRobot. Um, Wally. Like, well, oh, I, my God, yeah. Have you seen Wally <laughs> yeah. at the end where everybody's just kind of sitting around? Right. And that's how it's going to be because yeah. people aren't walking. Um, we're commuting everywhere. We're using scooters. Kids mm-hmm. are using all these different devices to get from point A to point B. Less and less kids are enrolling in sports. That's true. What are we doing? So it's really important to be physically active. And I can't stress that enough. And I don't know how else to preach that. I don't know what fun and exciting way I could present that to people. Well, I but think your Amped Boot Camp is going to be that's the, gonna be the easiest way to. Because you're going you're gonna to create a place where people can come. And they already know they're going to be comfortable. Yeah. Because it's affiliated with you. I hope so. So it's going to be a hit i hope so yeah. and, and and it's going to be a hit h-i-i-t yeah, yeah. that's what i meant oh, okay that's what i meant it's going to be you know pun there it's yeah, going to yeah. be a double hit i think that's the biggest thing also is a sense of community mm-hmm. i think we need to do things that get us out because it goes back to making human connection right it goes back to us just connecting to one another um and that's something that has we saw how much social isolation affects us as a whole during covid Mm -hmm. Um, people were more depressed more anxious they're isolated the worst thing that you could do to a human being is place them in solitary confinement yeah right and i'm not here to talk about solitary confinement right now (laughs) even though i've written papers on it but solitude is something that's necessary when it's voluntary and it's for a purpose for instance you're sitting down and preparing for this podcast you're taking notes you're brainstorming you need to be alone to to do that if you're studying for an I exam, I always think about when Jesus went to the, you know, for the forty days. Okay, and then he's like that was, you know, it had a purpose. Of course. And then he came back. But now, take a human, right? You, a perfectly sane human being, and put you in a solitary confinement mm-hmm. cell. And I'm, and this is an extreme example, obviously, but this is just uh, depriving a human of connection. Mm-hmm you will begin to have psychosis, auditory hallucinations, your sleep cycle will be off. You will, for the lack of a better term, go crazy, right? Right. You will have psychotic episodes, auditory hallucinations. You will, people become suicidal. They try, they self harm because there's no stimulation. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for somebody who, not to that extent, again, that was an extreme example. But if you take humans and you continue to 
isolate them like we already are through technology, it's not necessarily a good thing. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I was, I kept on preaching during quarantine and this whole preach for social distancing. I would tell people social distance, don't socially isolate. Right. Wow. That's yeah. such a, yeah, that's a big difference. Cool. You want a social distance, six feet, that's eight fine. feet, 10 feet. Cool. Yeah. Don't just completely block off humans from, from, mm -hmm. from your life. Cause it's, it's not going to be good for you. It's what not. do you, what do you think about kids wearing masks at school? Oh, you really want to go down this road. Mental, <laughs> Cause I, I've seen some doctors mention that it's not good for their mental health. I, I, and I'm just going to go, I haven't read any research. I haven't done any studies on this. I'm going to, I'll give my daughter as an example that I realized that she started to use a mask to hide behind. She started to use it as a means of social anxiety and she could kind of bury herself and hide behind this thing mm -hmm. where people couldn't really see her. Like the hoodie. I don't know. We're the from the same generation. Yeah. So it's like the, when we were growing up, the kids that would throw the hoodie yeah. on in the middle of summer. Yeah. And why? that's when you knew like something's up. Yeah. You know? Why is that kid hiding? Why does yeah. the kids need to shine? They need to be out there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I, I don't want to get into the debate um but no we're not looking to debate no but i want to say that there's some obvious psychological implications for kids wearing a mask right my daughter has plexiglass around her desk she's wearing a mask in school and i put up a post that I actually stole from somebody that says they should put they should put restaurant tables inside a classroom <laughs> so, that, so that kids can take off their masks that. when they sit down and it's like some of the rules just don't make sense. Um, right. I, I'm all for protecting the teachers. If the teacher feels that they're at risk, um, that's, what do you think about that? That's something I'll ask you. Yeah. Let's say if you were 65, you have comorbidities, mm -hmm. you're a teacher, and now they're telling you that the COVID is going to kill you. We know it's deadly. I have, mm -hmm. I have plenty of people who tell me all the time I, they work in the hospital and they're yeah. seeing the ICUs fill up. Right. So how do you feel as a teacher with comorbidities you're at higher risk and now you're surrounded with all these kids that are mm -hmm. basically potential vectors of a virus that can spread it right what I, do you do i think you need to quit your job damn that's rough i mean yes it is yeah. but you know I, and i'm sure you know this being yeah. a teacher is like being a health uh you know being in the health sector yeah. you're and not now with covid forever you are exposed to everything the kids bring mm -hmm. and there's only so much you can do and unless you can come up with a viable plan like creating pods in your classroom which isn't always possible because if you're middle or high school you know your classroom is a revolving door mm -hmm. um unless you can do something like that you're never going to be completely safe no matter how many masks your kids wear because your kids are not going to wear a mask effectively all day yeah no, the kids were um, running know, to the bathroom to hug my daughter. The papers <laughs> that like come, you know, back and forth. And let's say you have an electronic classroom. Okay, well, the papers get eliminated. But, um, you know, they touch the door handle. They'll, I don't know, drool on their desk. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't... It, it happens. Mm -hmm. They'll go to the bathroom and forget to wash their hands. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll chew gum and stick it under the desk. Wait, my accountant just told me her two-year-old was being required to wear a mask in daycare. Poor baby. What is oh what does that do God. to a two-year-old? So fine, my daughter's old enough to kind of process and be like, oh, whatever, right. it's part I of the rules. Like my daughter, right, she can understand people's expressions when they have a mask on. But for the, the younger ones, that they rely so much on the way you look at them and your expression and your demeanor. What does that do? Your nonverbal communication. What does that do? Neurologically, right? Them? Yeah, that, that's my question. Yeah. Not should people wear a mask because whatever. We yeah. don't. I think we're past that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's. I, and I don't have answers, but I know there's. De <laughs> we know that there's something that's yeah. going to happen. There's definitely. For every action, there's a reaction, right? Right. And if you're forcing two year olds to, to wear a mask in daycare, mm -hmm. there's. There's going to be something that happens as a result. Okay, fine. Right. You're protecting the daycare workers. You're protecting somebody in there. But what also, what are the psychological implications for that child? How does that affect them? How does that affect right. a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old? Right. Um, and I, I think that we're super early in the experiment mm -hmm. to really have, tr to truly draw true conclusions from it. Right. Yeah.
And by the way, I don't mean like teachers need to leave their jobs. That's not what I meant. Oh. Let me let me backtrack. Let me clarify. I just mean if you have a lot of health issues, it might not be a safe place for you, and you should try to reconsider. No, no, no. Don't no. come for me. They're gonna you're gonna see that in quotes, and you're gonna get hate mail. Have you gotten? You haven't gotten any hate emails? Not yet. Oh, I have. I'm not as important. I'm not that important either. I mean, but I've gotten a few. I'll let you know when the first one comes yeah, through. It'll be like a rite of passage. Just screenshot it. Yeah. I think the more you put yourself out there in social media and you'll say something, mm -hmm. and there's somebody out there, if it gets spread enough, yeah. that it'll just be like, how dare you? Right. You don't know what happened to me. And it's like, well, that, well, one, that might not even have been what I meant, or I'm so sorry that that happened to you, but I don't even know. It's weird, though. Exactly. So I wanted to ask you about body positivity. <laughs> and how do you... Go ahead. No. What, what is even my question? Um, because you have your amped workouts coming up, and you've obviously seen the benefits of working out, mm -hmm. but we we see so much in social media about body positivity and even like commercials now. And, you know, what is that other thing they say? Um, to toxic positivity. I'm sure okay. You've heard yeah. That toxic too. positivity. Yeah. So yeah. that's like the counter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It just it seems like everything's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just give you my stance, right? Um, I'm preaching physical activity. Mm hmm. I'm preaching if you want to see a change in your body, then there's actions that you have to take in order to see a change. I think that a lot of people, there's a lot of people with genetic predispositions that don't allow them to lose weight or look a certain way or have a certain body type. Do I want them to feel ashamed of their body type? Absolutely not. I want people to love themselves. I want people to love who they are but also recognize if there's shortcomings that they need to strive towards and they need to work and they need to work their ass off in the gym, running or some sort of physical activity. Am I saying that you're going to have this optimal body? No. Mm -hmm. If I took off my shirt right now, I'm not going to and flex. Half of my pec is ripped off. So my right pec is damaged, right? So my chest doesn't look the way it used to, the way I liked it. Right. But I still love my body. Mm -hmm. It doesn't function the same way it used to. Um, but I'm not going to be ashamed of it. Right. Right. So. Yeah, it seems like there's a correlation that if, if there's something you want to change about yourself physically, you don't love yourself. That's false. And that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, no. Again, because we're going to Because if you love extremes. yourself, wouldn't you always want to improve? In whatever that means, it means something different for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Right. I, I think that. I, I'm, I'm in pretty damn good shape, honestly. I go in the gym and I, I'm probably one of the ones that are in most shape. And I'm mm -hmm. not trying to brag. I'm just saying, like, I know that. Well, fit, I mean, you've from, worked for that. Yeah, from a physical right. fitness perspective, I've been working out since I was ten. I've never stopped. I mean, I've been active my whole life since I was, honestly, since I was a child. But exercise became a part of my life at about ten, eleven. Sports have always been part of my life, but then physical fitness. For as, young, as for as young as I can remember, I got a broomstick, I found some weights in somebody's garbage, and I took those to my backyard and I made it work. That's awesome. Yeah, so it's always been part of me. Um, and But it was always about the physical activity mm -hmm. and the outlet, and it was never like, oh, I'm going to be this chiseled model. Yeah, as a young kid, right. do you want to be on the cover of Men's Health? Sure, but I also love cookies and milk. <laughs> yeah. Cafe con leche yeah, cafe con, No, mine is... And chips ahoy or oreos cookies and milk at night is my oh my, my god that's your downfall oh every night last night took cookies and milk that's a, hilarious my daughter would would agree with that yeah, yeah. That's but awesome. so if anything i want people to recognize like physical activity is number one if you are extreme if you are obese or overweight and you want to make a change then it's going to take work mm -hmm. you can still love yourself but want change and i think that's exactly what you said there's not a separation between the two. They exist right. together. Right. And I don't know why that's not existing in conversation right now. No, that's and that's such an interesting question. Why have the two become mutually exclusive? It doesn't make sense. Because we live in a world of division right now. And I feel like everything is either team A or team B. You're either on this right. tribe or that tribe. Right. And there's not a conversation with nuance. Mm -hmm. Because you know why? Because that requires energy, effort, and a conversation and taking the risk that you might be wrong or taking the risk that you might disagree yeah 
and yeah. it's okay. Yeah. I don't have to be right. This mm -hmm. is just my perspective on the world. Maybe there are some harms to wanting change in your body because you just can't. Right. Okay, I can accept that. But it's my opinion that if you want change, you could still love yourself and strive for that change. Women Absolutely. have certain women have surgeries now. Am I shaming them for having a surgery? No. If if you feel better about it and it's your body, I say go for it. If if it's gonna help you, your self esteem, your outlook on life, mm -hmm. your quality of life, then go for it. Is there an extreme to that where you do something to your body that becomes, you know, body dysmorphia where there's a problem? Right. Yeah, any Absolutely. extreme is bad. Yeah. Yeah. But it ex exists on a spectrum. So we don't know at what there's not like this yeah. point where you say, oh, this is a disease and this is normal. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting. It's yeah. interesting how that works. So you mentioned that you are from Hialeah. Yep. So you were born here, but you're of Cuban descent. Yes. And um, you've been super vocal in your social media about what's going on over there. Yeah. It's gone quiet, right? You, right? Ha you haven't heard it. It was yeah. a month. It was what, July 11th. Mm -hmm. And then since July 11th, we're now and today is September 1st. Yeah. And how quickly we the, forgot. the news cycle moves on. Now we're in Afghanistan. Right. Um, but yeah, I became very vocal just because I saw what was going on in Cuba and I felt a need. The Have first, you been? I've been multiple times. Yeah. Right. I've been just by myself. I've been. Do you have family there? I have second cousins. Um, okay. still I go and I visit when I have gone, mm -hmm. I didn't even know that they really existed until I was going and my grandmother told me, Oh, oh go wow. visit them. Yeah. That's and so I went and they accepted me with open arms Of course. and it was cool. You know, it was, it was a great experience, but that's awesome. I've oh, never been back. You haven't that's been. why I asked like, if you've been, how, how oh, did that feel? I love Cuba. Yeah. I love it again because I, I think it's. For one, it's a way. Okay, I I left when I went. I left Cuba. <laughs> I never left Cuba. I left Hialeah. <laughs> Same, right? So I went to Cuba. You traded one. Yeah, yeah, I went to Cuba, and what I got was a sense of nostalgia to a place I had never been. Right? How can you have nostalgia? These feelings from your past. Well, yeah. And that's what I felt. That's that's why that's what being displaced as an immigrant creates. Exactly. This this sense of belonging to a place that you haven't even seen, but you know that's home. that's where you come from. That's home. It was the weirdest. Yeah. This is home. I I told yeah. myself when I was there, and and it wasn't because I grew up in the United States, and I'm proud, and Absolutely. I'm grateful yeah. that I grew up in the United States. But I think it's important for me to understand where I come from. Right. And when I was about 18, I started reading books on Cuba. I don't know what book this is, but I right away I looked at it. This is. Yeah, this is uh, by an uh, American Cuban writer. Her name is Ana Menendez. In Cuba, was a German Shepherd. I yeah. highly recommend if you if you haven't read it. <clears throat> Excuse me. She she writes about yeah. It's like a set of short stories that they're all connected somehow. And she writes about that how um, you have this longing for a place that you've never even been to, mm -hmm. but you know there's a a deep connection there. Yeah, I was actually so. there right before COVID. Um, I was, oh, wow. yeah, I almost, you know, when Trump announced, oh, we're not going to be letting any flights in from <gasps> Cuba. I was in Cuba. You know, that's, that's one of like my biggest fears that you mentioned, like you had a fear. Oh. Well, my, one of my biggest fears is being in, in Cuba or in a place and being stuck and being stuck and being stranded and not being allowed to leave. That's interesting. Yeah. My mentality was <laughs> if I'm stuck here, that's going to be a great story. Oh my God. No, dude. I, <laughs> I can't even, I can't even tell you. And it probably comes from real life experience because I was stuck there yeah. for, for a long time. Yeah. Um, so I don't ever want to be put in that position again. No. And I think, and I, I was actually fearful the more vocal I became about Cuba because I was mm -hmm. like, wait, if I talk too much, am I not going to be able to go back? Wow, that's it, a good point. If I put too much on social yeah. media and this, because a couple of my posts got like 30,000 views or something like or that. If, if you do go back and something happens to you, God forbid. Yeah. Like, what if I go back and all of a sudden that's it? They just say, oh, you. Oh, remember you were talking? Let's let's take you to this prison here so we could talk to you for a little while. And yeah, you just literally people disappear. So if they dis yeah, if they make do. their own citizens disappear, what makes me special mm -hmm. as a guy with a, f with a camera wandering around Cuba being nosy, talking to random people he doesn't even know? I'm blasting it on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. So I 
I worry right now about going back to Cuba. Yeah. But uh, what am I going to do? I can't live my life in fear. You know? No. No, I, I think that, yeah, you just, you put it excellently. We we have to just move on. Yeah. Uh, from the fear, I mean. Not yeah, from yeah, the from the fear. Yeah, yeah, from the yeah. fear, absolutely. Yeah. Um. So I just would, I was just posting whatever I thought and some, I was heard for whatever reasons. Um, and now again, this goes back to. I think your pictures had a lot to do with it too, because yeah. they were very raw. So I went to Cuba not want for me, wanting to understand what daily life is, and I. This is me in every country that I go to. I just have this desire to really understand el pueblo, like, or what is yeah. the struggle? What is life like not, here? Not the the picture they paint for you as a tourist don't take me to south don't come to miami and take me to south beach and tell me i've been to miami you haven't been to miami mm -hmm. right let's go to hialeah let's go to westchester yeah. let's go to kendall let's see how day-to-day -day, let's go to coral gables let's go right. to brickle let's go to all these different areas where people really live and not just what tur where tourism takes you mm -hmm. and so that's what i do in cuba all right what i've done in other countries is i want to go to those places where i can learn from right. the people and see what daily life is like and that's what i did um, and that's why I took those those images because, and it, but it was funny because I took all these images and nobody cared. And so it was just a matter of timing, right? Because mm -hmm. Cuba became a hot topic and I started posting and writing about it. And that's when people started noticing me um, and noticing, oh, cool. Look, this guy's showing the real picture in Cuba. Right. But they were also taking my images and misconstruing some of what I really? felt, yeah, because my pictures, all those show poverty and suffering, I always tell people I see hope and strength and resilience in them. Yeah. But people... There's no better example of the the human spirit, yeah. right, than yeah. in the Cuban people. Yeah, so, and innovation. Like, oh, yeah. When you see what things can be invented and reinvented, when mm -hmm. you don't, when when materials are scarce, Go to Cuba. You'll see some inventions that you're like, how are these cars from the 1950s still running? Right. What kind of engines do they have inside of them? Like, and, I understood a lot more about myself, right. about my dad and why he doesn't throw stuff away, why he feels like everything is valuable. And I'm like, that is garbage. Throw it away. Yeah. But it's because he grew up in this society where there wasn't. And now I understand why so many Cubans want cash-only businesses because they want to hide from the government. They want less government. They, they don't want smaller. trust the government. Yeah, so they want smaller government. That's why they lean so far right. That's why they're so die-hard Republican because they f they know what big government can do mm -hmm. and how it can destroy lives and take businesses and take land and and divide families. And so, but yeah, going back to that, it, just Cuba was again my own personal mission. Right. You know, it was another mission field where I wanted to understand what was going on and I needed it for me. Yeah. Um, and then I also wanted to just show people like, these are people in Cuba and these are our family. This is our family. These are This is our tribe, our people. And here they are. So don't forget about them either. Because, okay, okay so my opinion is that we should be traveling to Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Cuban government is going to have money no matter what. Again, this mm -hmm. is a controversial topic. Because when I go to Cuba, I see that I'm helping El Pueblo and I'm helping that person who's selling cafe out of their house mm -hmm. and I'm a cafe out of their house. I'm helping people from the street. Like if I tip right. a BC taxi, I'm not feeding the government. Right. You're now. helping that person. Yeah. But if you stay in a major hotel and you're doing all these touristy things. Or you go look for 16 year old girls. <laughs> yes. Then that's when yeah. you're running into trouble. Yeah. That's when you're running into trouble. And that's when you're feeding the government. And that's when you're feeding a completely different system right super controversial especially if i when if an older cuban who's mm -hmm. super anti-communism anti Castro, no you're mm -hmm. supporting the government i don't think so when yeah. i've been i've been there to support my family i've been there to support mm -hmm. the people and right. i think that when you strip tourism away like let's say the cruise ships that land there yeah do they feed the government a lot yes but but as you, as a tourist wandering around Havana, mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to provide a little bit more for the individuals who are living there in a state yeah. of poverty. I agree with that. I I haven't gone back because um, well, it's a loaded question, <laughs> I, and you didn't even ask me. No. You just volunteered. No, no go for it. Why didn't you? Why haven't you gone back? Um, no, I meant to say like I would one day want to go back. I just haven't because 
uh, because I was born there, it's so difficult for me to go back. Mm -hmm. Like I need all this extra paperwork that requires a lot of time and money as opposed to someone like you. You know, you can just book your ticket and go. I can't do that. So it requires like an extra visa. Yeah, you need a visa. I need my Cuban passport Mm -hmm. as opposed to my American passport. It's like a bunch of nonsense. You give up your rights as an American citizen when you go with your Cuban passport, something along those lines. Yeah, all those things that I'm extremely uncomfortable with. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, and then to add to that, I, um, you know, I wasn't raised in a very um, Cuban way in the sense like I wasn't out playing with with the kids Mm -hmm. in the the street. I was like, I had a very different upbringing yeah because so, you, to- you told me that you always knew that you were coming to the united states as a kid in cuba right yeah exactly yeah, yeah. my father came first when i was very young um you know my my family was very anti-castro we had some family members that had been in jail for years we you know we knew we didn't fit in completely so it was it, it it's been like an interesting dichotomy mm-hmm. uh to to have because it's like I, I love it. I love where I come from and I'm not denying that. But at the same time it's Does your ugh. family tell you don't go back? No. My father has been back. Oh he has? Okay. He has, yeah. He's been back a couple of times for family members. Mm-hmm. You know, some people have gotten sick and stuff. Yeah. He's been back. But I haven't, not yet. Yeah, but the... I plan to, you know, especially when my kids are older, I wanna see I want them to see like where we come from and stuff of course and yeah. i want i want to take my daughter i, yeah, definitely I think that's so important she says no it looks old like, <laughs> it looks old that's because even... it is yeah i'm like yeah well it hasn't been updated since 1950 yeah, girl, so it's very old um i hadn't gone back. well i was told don't go back and i think like so many cubans oh don't go back don't or don't go i had not go back because i had never gone right. but when i told my it's so many times in life now that i'm thinking about it is that people tell you don't do something. That's and, when you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I went to the army when my mom told me don't go and I went and it helped my life. And I went to Cuba and it was something that definitely was rewarding for me. And the day before I left to Cuba, my grandmother folds up a piece of paper, gives it to me, gives me an address. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. This whole time you've been telling me that now you're going to hand me an address and tell me to go to a certain place. That's so funny. And so I went. It was really cool, actually. That's so funny. Yeah. So were you able to see like where your mom grew up, or yeah, uh, in the house next door, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I don't, I don't remember That's those so details. Cool. Yeah, it was actually strange. Um, I pulled up in a scooter, holding on in the back, mm-hmm. and I get off, and the guy's like, "Yeah, this is this is it." So then the scooter just leaves. I'm in the middle of I don't even know where in Havana, and so I knock on the door, and some lady comes out, and she's like, "I can't busca." And I was like, Eduardo? And then she's like, oh, un momentico. Eduardo! <laughs> like that. And I was like, I was like, oh, okay. So then this little old man comes out, opens the door, doesn't say anything. Opens the door, tells me to come inside. Tells me to have a seat. It's dark, old, brown, like leather couch, or I don't even know what material it was. And he tells me to have a seat, so I have a seat. And he crosses his legs, and he just says, con que te puedo ayudar? And I'm thinking, if a stranger came and knocked on my door in Miami, the hell do you I, want? Yeah, I'm looking at the. <laughs> I'm I'm like, you need something? What do you need? Yeah, it's and, true. Um, and when I told him who I was, like I could just see his his eyes open, and he was like honored to have me there. And they took whatever rations of chicken, and they made me lunch, and I spent the whole day with them. Oh, that's uh, nice. Yeah, so it was uh, hospitality wise. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy to know that somebody has nothing and they're offering you mm-hmm. what they have. It's true. Like, so it's that's, true. It was a great experience. Every time I've been back to Cuba, I learned something, I gained something. Um, and again, for me, <laughs> as selfish as that is. Yeah. Know. No, I mean, it, it's good to create experiences for yourself where it's a two way street. Yeah. 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 It's, and they're so happy and they want to ask you yeah. questions and know about you and they're just interested why because they're stuck and they have no they can't go anywhere yeah their life is on pause yeah it's forever forever it's terrible <laughs> it's terrible your life is whatever is presented to you and the opportunities are limited mm-hmm. unless you're an athlete or a reggaetonero or right uh, 
those are your options to really get out. Yeah. Or if you become a physician and you get shipped out somewhere and then you mm -hmm. defect that way, but it's the options are limited. Or si tiene fe. Do you know what that means? I don't. So somebody told me the people who live here son esos que tienen fe, and I'm thinking fe like faith in, in the in the communist party. Wait, wait, no, 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 no. They're talking about amongst the people. This was a taxi driver in Cuba told me los que viven aquí, los que viven bien son esos que tienen fe. So I'm like fe like faith like religious like God. Mm -hmm. I'm like yeah sure, okay fe. And he's like no 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 fe. Familia en la extranjera. And <laughs> oh I'm like, oh, okay, makes sense. So, yeah, that's it. You need family outside of Cuba in order to for you to, to, to prosper. To your life. Yeah, it's it's so, so sad. It's so sad. And hopefully we're starting to see the beginning of the end. <sighs> I don't know. I'm hopeful. I, I wish. Yeah. Um, it's just really hard to change uh, an ideology mm -hmm. that's honestly permeating the world this is spreading right. this is spreading to bolivia it's spreading to brazil it's spreading to argentina um, it's everywhere yeah so it's everywhere and so many people no matter i've noticed i don't know if you've noticed that too how much proof you show them it doesn't matter because they believe this thing wholeheartedly and they're going to hang on to it for dear life mm-hmm and you know they'll it'll change the name. It's like a chameleon, you know. It'll mm -hmm. change the name. There'll be a million excuses. Well, they didn't do it right. They didn't, you know, it didn't work for them because, because X, Y, and Z. But this is still gonna work. Yeah, and it's like how many people have to die and suffer for an idea that it's stupid. Yeah, beautiful on paper. Theoretically, I can see where there's a draw. But in but that's practice, that's what we have books for. You want to go yeah. experience a perfect life? Read a book. <laughs> read a fiction. Read a book. utopia and be happy in your in in your bliss. But the human factor comes in, as I'm sure you've seen through your life experiences, and you can account for that. Power. No matter how like perfect your plan is, the human factor is predictably unpredictable. All right, we're gonna get real controversial. Let's if do it. you were. You're Cuban, right? Yeah. What if you were born into the Cuban government and you were somebody of very high, high level, mm -hmm. you had a lot of power, you can travel the world however you want. What's it going to take for you to let go of that power? Uh, it would probably take a lot of humanity. Okay, but what if and what if it's ingrained in you that these are just, you know, you, you're, you're something royalty. Something has to happen to you where it hurts you on a personal level. For you to make that transition, I, I feel think, like. You know what happens to those people? What? They're executed. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. Well, I was telling you, like, my grandfather was in jail for, like, five years, I believe, for, you know, being a, a police officer for Batista. That's all he did. Yeah. And that was enough. Now there's a law just I'm passed. I'm super lucky that he didn't get shot because all of his friends did. Oh, they were executed on the spot. They were executed. Yeah. Yeah. And he wasn't because they needed a chef and he was able to cook. Wow. So he became the prison chef. And that's how he stayed alive. Um, but everybody else was gone. Which you think, like, why would you need a chef? You're killing off everybody. But they did. And it's, yeah, but it's, it's interesting to, you know, see. Because the other side is always a bad side. Exactly. And it's very easy to demonize the other side. Of course. We've seen yeah. it throughout history. We've yeah. seen it in the Holocaust, right? Yeah. I, I think that was one of the biggest things that affected me as a kid was when I realized what the Holocaust was and what happened. And, and seeing... when you think about what if, what if you were in Germany in that time, what, what side would you have been on? How easy would you, would it have been for you to turn your face and go, that's just happening to the Jews. Mm -hmm. It's none of my business. Exactly. Because that's essentially what happened, not to compare, because it's not comparable it's at not, all. No. But in Cuba, you know, if n now that you've been, I'm sure you've noticed huge pockets of, of multicultural neighborhoods. So you have like the Cuban Jews, the Chinese Cubans, mm -hmm. the Spanish Cubans, the Italian Cubans. Mm -hmm. 
and there was never really this unifying when Cuba gained its independence, this unifying factor. Everybody was just like in their little bubbles. Mm-hmm. So when Castro comes in, it's it's very easy for the Chinese to go, oh no, that's the that's the, the Cuban problem. We're not Cuban, mm-hmm. we're Chinese, you know, for the whites to go, oh that's a black people problem mm-hmm. or the blacks to go, but that's that's white people business. Mm-hmm. We don't get involved. Mm-hmm. And everybody just turns their face. Until it's, it's you. Until it's you. And then you're like, shit, it's here. So that's why I was saying earlier, it's okay to question mm-hmm. things as they're coming and just presented you in a way. It's okay to question it. Stop demonizing people for just questioning. Right. Right. In school, they always, oh, there's no stupid questions, right? But all of a sudden, it's not even stupid questions. They're evil questions. Yeah. So it's like, and kids get judged yeah. heavily, yeah, for their questions that they're asking, and it, to me, it's so heartbreaking. And I'm sure it's to you, you're an educator as well, mm-hmm. to to not have because that's one of the things that, as an educator, you pride yourself in to create an environment where you are not just producing learning, but encouraging learning beyond your doors. You want to an- create people that are going to be inquisitors and seek of course knowledge once they leave your your domain and be able to exchange ideas right and go wait how did this happen how did you know i want to know more you know now and beyond when they're 50s 60s for them to pick up a book and go i want to know more about this yeah so i mean i'm I'm thinking about this now why are we creating these environments where questions are not welcome where questions are so evil and that's why when you push an agenda on people and you force them into it now they're gonna they're gonna rebel even more mm-hmm. and they're gonna have their guard up because rather than having a conversation an explanation a fair exchange of like oh wait yeah now you're just forcing something on them and people are gonna push people are, their defenses are gonna get up right, right away why because it's human nature fight or flight mm-hmm. Right. You know, I noticed something. I started teaching in 2007. And when I started teaching, I was also a debate coach. And, you know, you would start a lecture or whatever. And you go, okay, what do you guys think? Millions of opinions. Everybody has an opinion. And everybody has something to say. As the years went by, what do you think? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. My daughter drives me nuts. I don't, I don't know. know. Um, and then, unless a celebrity had said something about it, no one would know. say something about it. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that to me was so eye-opening. Like, why do you have to wait for someone to tell you how you should feel about something? Or how you should think about something. Right. It's dangerous. And especially somebody that you don't even know. Mm-hmm. You don't know this person. You have no idea who they are. They sing a song on, on your Instagram or whatever. Uh-huh. And that's it. <laughs> I think it's dangerous. I think yeah. kids need to learn how to be inquisitive and how to ask questions and give their own opinions and, and be able to have that back and forth. That's what I thought college was going to be about. Yeah, was like this exchange of ideas between people and recognizing, oh, wait, I can learn from this kid over here because mm-hmm. he's going this, through the same program that I am. But he has a very different life. The way he frames life is very different. Right. His perspective on life, the way his upbringing has been different. So he comes from a from a very different perspective. And how do I take what I thought of the world and what he's describing to me? And how do I allow that to give me now more vision as opposed to me shutting down and, clo- oh, no, he's still wrong. And let me just stay over here. No, I need to really listen. Mm-hmm. I, need to understand, I need to understand what a kid's life is like growing up in Overtown. Right. Because then I can understand, oh, he didn't have that many opportunities. He didn't have much going on. So, yeah, it's it's uh, it's complicated. But um, I think it just comes down to us having conversations and asking questions more than anything else. Absolutely. And I think we can't end it on a better note than that. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here and sharing. Thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Oh, absolutely. Seriously. Likewise. Yeah, I hope you're back soon. And I hope uh, Amped Boot Camp opens up Coming quickly yeah. and it spreads like wildfire i hope so too yeah i hope so too i hope my business continues to grow and i i hope that um i i'm i'm not even gonna hope 
this audience this audience is gonna grow for this podcast so. <laughs> oh thank you yeah. thank you i appreciate that right. and to everybody listening thank you so much and as always we appreciate that you're here uh we will link all of dr mesa's uh information down below so i hope they reach out to you with any questions and seek the help that they need thank you. We'll see you guys next time.